Hi everybody church, how are you? I am Sam Jerry and I am excited and delighted to be here. I am loving being part of this community where we are loved, we are accepted, and we are affirmed. There are no boxes to check here. I've already connected with a few of you on Facebook. I encourage you to go there. It's facebook.com backslash everybody church. There you'll find information, past conversation starters, and kind of community within community with groups that are forming. I encourage you to go there. I guarantee that you'll find a place to get plugged in. Okay, today's conversation starter is being brought to us by Stan Mitchell. Two things happen when I hear Stan speak. One, my vocabulary grows, and two, my understanding deepens. Today, Stan's gonna to talk to us about Joseph. Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. And although I can't fathom that level of rejection, betrayal, and abandonment, I can empathize with the struggle that it takes to get from abandonment and rejection to healing and forgiveness. So get ready, get comfortable, and let's start a conversation. Hey everybody, church, it's good to be with you. Uh, always good to be with you. I, I look forward to this all week long. The stories that are coming out of our time together are really remarkable. This is so much more than just a lesson a week that myself or Ray or one of our friends teach. This really is a community that we're just watching, we're sitting back and watching just naturally develop. And I just, I, I would be remiss not to say that I'm really grateful to be a part of this. Uh, I'm also grateful to share a story with you from scripture that is one of the most powerful stories that uh, I've ever read in scripture or otherwise. It's a story from the book of Genesis, one of my favorite books of the Bible, and it's the story of a fellow by the name of Joseph. And gosh, I could do a 10-part series. As a matter of fact, I have done a 10-part series on this text, uh, but let me spare you that and just give you the cleft note version of this and um, try to summarize some really important things about this issue called forgiveness. For anybody raised around the church, you know that a big part of Joseph's story is uh, that, that this was a story of forgiveness. This was a fella, the younger brother of 10 older brothers, who was horrifically betrayed by the very people who should have protected and loved him. Um, almost killed by his brothers, but then sold into slavery. This kid at the age of 17 years old goes down to Egypt, separated from his father, thrown away by his brothers. He ends up a slave and then he ends up in prison. It's really a remarkable story of years of just abandonment and betrayal and pain. But 22 years pass from Genesis 30, 39 to Genesis 45, and Genesis 45 is where I really wanna get to with you today. 22 years of, of heartbreak, and yet 22 years of really remarkable providence. In the middle of all the heartbreak, it seems at his lowest moments, God would be with him and something remarkable would happen. And ultimately the most remarkable part of the story up to Genesis 45 is that this betrayed kid who became a slave, who ultimately was imprisoned unjustly, finds himself somehow in God's sovereignty, elevated to the second most powerful position in all of Egypt. And in that setting, in that position, he's put in a specific scenario where he is able to re-engage the 10 brothers who had betrayed him almost a quarter of a century before. He's over this uh, granary of sorts, this storehouse it was called in Egypt, uh, the entire land is in a period of famine, and that famine has extended up into the Levant where his brothers live, the area we now call Palestine. And they had gone down to Egypt because they heard there was a huge storehouse there, not knowing that the younger brother they had betrayed all the years before was over that storehouse. And through a series of remarkable events, Joseph is able to engage these 10 brothers. The story culminates in a final moment He's engaged them over a period of a couple of years and never revealed himself to them. But all of those engagements, those interactions have yielded this, this cumulative, this culminating moment where he is about to reveal himself to them. And when he reveals himself to them in this 45th chapter, 
I remember a few years ago, I was reading this text and I saw some things in the text that really gave me a profound sense of this is what forgiveness looks like. I mean, forgiveness is one of those things you hear it defined a million different ways and it's easy to talk about theologically, maybe even in scripturally, but it's, it's much more difficult to talk about in flesh tones, incarnationally in our life. But as I was reading this story, it really fleshed out for me some things that I think are indications that we can look and say, you know, uh, the work of forgiveness has really taken place in my mind and my heart when I see these things. So let me just get into the text and just read through a few of these things with you. I think, it, I think they're really profound. Then Joseph, verse 1 of chapter 45 says, Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him. So his ten brothers are there, vulnerable and prone. He's told them that he's going to keep the youngest brother, Benjamin, and he's going to let all of them go back to their father's house, but he's going to keep this youngest boy uh, that was his favored brother. He had probably left many years before, or when he had left many years before, the boy was probably just a small, what we would call an elementary child. And he's telling his brothers now, I'm going to keep this youngest son, but you can return to your father. And the older brothers step forward now and they say, no, we can't do that because our father's already lost a boy like this. And that son was lost in circumstances that they wouldn't describe, but circumstances that to some extent they, they were indicating were unfavorable about them. And they said, we're, we're not gonna go home because we're not gonna see our father broken like that again. It's interesting that at that moment that Joseph is watching the older brothers intervene and offer themselves on behalf of the younger brother that he breaks. Because Joseph in that moment for sure realizes that not only over the last 22 years has God been working in his heart, but something we often forget in our wounding, God also loves the one who wounded us. And on the other end of this of this relationship, his brothers also had been in prison. His brothers also evidently had been enslaved, not physically, but in their own hearts. Because now he's looking at men who to some extent have changed. Men who 22 years before would have thrown him away for two pieces of silver apiece. And now they're standing here willing to give their life on behalf of a young favored brother. You, you know you've forgiven when you want the one who's hurt you to get better. You, you know you've forgiven when you can even recognize in the one who hurt you that they've changed. I know that there have been moments in my life when I didn't want that for the person who hurt me. I didn't want to think that they could get better. I didn't want to think that they could be sorry. I wanted them to somehow get theirs like they gave me mine. But when he saw that these were changed men, the Bible said he did something else that I think is an indication of forgiveness. He literally screams out. I mean, it's not just the 10 brothers with Benjamin, the 11th brother standing there, but all of his court, all of his attendants are there. All of these Egyptian people that he worked with were there. And it's interesting what he screams out. He literally screams out, everybody get out except the brothers. You know that forgiveness is working in your heart when you don't want the story of your wounding and the story of the other person's wrongdoing. You don't want that story spread and you don't want it expanded. I know what it's like to have been hurt and wanted to share that hurt with others. I know what it's like to have wanted to defend myself by making the person who hurt me look bad as much as I could make them look bad by sharing their story. The Bible says that love covers a multitude of sins. Now, that's different than covers up. You know, a cover up is when, I suppose the best definition of a cover up is when I've done something wrong and I don't want to own that and I don't want to admit that. 
cover up is what we do to cover our own flaws and not bring repair to them or repentance to them. Cover is what we do for the other person. Scripture says love covers a multitude of sin, but hatred, it stirs up a matter. I think this is what Jesus was saying when he said, you know, if your brother sins, whether it's against you or someone else, but if, you're, if your brother or sister does something offensive, you remember, he said, go to them. Don't go to your friends. Don't go to their friends. Don't go to social media. Don't lick your wounds by, you know, passive aggressively telling what's happened to you in an effort to make the other person look bad. Love covers a multitude of sins. It doesn't want to extend the story. Joseph looked at a lot of people who weren't involved, and he said, you don't need to know about this. Everybody out of the room except these guys. The Bible says that after sending everybody out of the room, the brothers are standing there quaking in their shoes. Surely they, they, they had no idea that this was the brother they had betrayed all those years before standing in front of them. They had no idea what was about to be revealed to them. And the Bible says when everybody was out of the room, Joseph then looked at them and said, I, I am Joseph. What's so perhaps the most compelling thing about this passage is what he says next. Because I have to believe on that auction block, in that slavery, in the, in the unjust imprisonment, that there had been many a night dark night when he had rolled over steeping and basting in his bitterness and pain at the injustice that he had thought to himself if I ever see them if I ever get my hands on them have you ever done that have you ever just savored the words you know measured the words this is what I'm going to say when I finally get my chance this is what I'm going to say but the Bible says that when he looked at them, a real strong indication that he had forgiven them was what came next out of his mouth. I am Joseph. Is dad still alive? You know you've forgiven when the wound, the issue, the infraction, the injustice is no longer the major thought in your mind, when it's no longer the pressing issue on your heart, of all the things he could have said to them, I'm Joseph, what do you have to say for yourself now? I'm Joseph, hello boys. Of all the ways he could have made them squirm and exacted his punishment and retribution on them. He looks at them and the scripture says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And a forgiving heart was revealed when he said, I'm Joseph. His dad's still alive. Emily Dickinson wrote a poem called A Great Hope Fell. It was a poem about a wound that had taken place in her life. Engaged to a young congregational minister, he broke their engagement and moved away from the little New England town where uh, they lived, and where he was a pastor of a church, he followed the gold rush out to California, and he broke off his engagement, and he did it in a, in a really horrific way. He, he didn't even tell her goodbye. She had to find out from others that this young man had broken their engagement and left town. It was, a lot of people who knew her said that's when she kind of began to descend down into the, you know, plummet down into the goth, dark figure that she became. She wrote about that event, and in the poem, A Great Hope Fell, in the third stanza, stanza, she says, the wound untended, think about that, the wound untended grew so large until my whole life entered it. Have you ever known someone whose whole life has fallen into this victim's well. Have you ever been that person who gets so absorbed in the wound that your whole life falls into it? 
there's no doubt. I mean, this story takes a few minutes to tell, but there was a 22 year period from that well that his brothers had put him in and this moment. And, and I, I, I don't doubt but what many of those years was his effort to crawl out of that wound to tend that wound with the antibodies of, the antibiotics of grace and perspective and mercy and love. If wounds grow untended, they become infected and they can even become gangrenous and lead to amputations and death. Somewhere Joseph began to tend those wounds until he could stand before his brothers and the first words out of his mouth were, I'm Joseph, is dad still alive? You know you've forgiven when the wound is no longer the major issue. The Bible says that his brothers couldn't answer him. Of course they couldn't. I mean, 22 years they had been reliving this event. 22 years they had no doubt wanted to repent, but there was no doubt in some of their hearts this desire to fix the situation, but it could not be fixed. And now they're standing here, and there he is, this brother that they thought would have been dead by now. The Bible says they were dismayed in his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, please come near to me. You know that the work of forgiveness is happening in your heart when you don't want the person who hurt you to be dismayed in your presence. I've, I've, I've been there before when I thought I had forgiven, but what I had really done was just partially forgiven. You know, I, I, I didn't forgive the debt. I just amortized it at a high interest rate relationally over a period of time. I didn't forgive the debt, I just deferred it into a payment plan, and part of the payment that the person has to make every month or every time they meet me is to be a little bit destabilized and uncomfortable in my presence. I act like I've magnanimously let them off the hook, but I haven't let them off the hook. There's still this relational payment plan where they know that I know that they know that I know, that this is an uneven cast, that they they deserve to be a little dismayed whenever they're around me. You know you've forgiven someone when you don't want them dismayed in your presence. And you look at them and say, I want you to come near to me again. Now, of course, this begs another issue. Does forgiveness always demand trust? And I I, I don't think it does. I think love is unconditional. I think forgiveness to a a great extent is free. But trust is something that's earned. And so I, I don't think that in any way Joseph is giving them his full confidence again. But at the least, he wants their hearts to be healed. He wants them to not be dismayed in his presence. And then this, and I I think this is a profound point that kind of ties into what I just said about trust. When they finally came near to him, Joseph said, I am Joseph, your brother. And listen to this line, whom you sold into Egypt. Forgiveness is not the erasure of the event. Forgiveness is not um, sweeping the event under the rug. Joseph doesn't say, I am Joseph that you sold into Egypt. But with a softening, he says, I'm Joseph. And there's no need to act like it didn't happen. You know what happened, I know what happened. I'm here, you're here. I am Joseph, the one you sold into slavery. I wrote this a while back. Forgiveness in no way diminishes what happened to you in your past. It does, though, transform the impact of that event on your present and your future. Forgiveness is not a glossing over, but in truth, it's the exact opposite. Forgiveness admits something happened to you. Forgiveness admits that something happened that shouldn't have, something that's now calling on the better angels of your nature to find and extend mercy, something that's calling you to offer grace. 
to offer grace to yourself first and then to the one who hurt you. Forgiveness is as much an act of self-compassion as it is charity for the offender, perhaps even more. I'm Joseph, the brother that you sold into Egypt. And immediately Joseph knows that this is going to cast them back into paroxysms of grief and shame and guilt. And he follows those words. Proof that his heart is softened to them. As soon as he admits what's happened, he says, but now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. You know you've forgiven someone when not only do you release the whip, the whip that you've wanted to whip them with, to hit back with, you know you've forgiven when not only do you release the whip, but you don't want them to pick it up. You don't want them to now self-flagellate and, and whip themselves. You want them to let themselves off the hook just as you have. And I, I've been there. I've been there when I was too righteous to you know, give evil for evil. I would not dare whip them for what they've done to me. But I, I did relish watching them whip themselves just a little bit. You know you're forgiven when you let go of the whip of retribution. You know you're forgiven when you don't want them to pick it up. Do not, therefore, be grieved with yourself. I think about an event that happened in Joseph's life before this. The Bible said that one day his servants came to him and said, you've had a son, his firstborn. The Bible tells us that Joseph held that little baby up and he said, I want to call him Manasseh. For Manasseh meant forgetting. I've always thought that was funny that a kid would be named forgetting. How'd you like to be in class and you know, your teacher say, hey, forgetting, would you come up and do you know, your, your multiplication charts on the chalkboard? The kid's name was forgetting. But the beautiful side of that is that as Joseph held that baby, he described, I think, really the work of forgiveness. He said, I want to call this baby forgetting. For the Lord has made me forget all the sorrow of my father's house. And I think that first line, for God has made me, in, in other words, this is a divine work in my soul. I do think that there are people who have been hurt deeply enough in life. I think there are some people who have been hurt deeply enough in life that they find themselves down in the pit of that wound and all they can do, and maybe this was what he did one night, he rolled over in that prison and said, the wound was severe enough, but the bitterness and the infection that's growing from it is even worse. And he just cracked the door of his heart open to God and said, I can't do this. You're going to have to do it in me. And now all of those years later, he states that work of forgiveness, that divine act of forgiveness by saying, call him forgetting for the Lord has made me forget. God walked into that cracked door and the divine work has taken place in me. For the Lord has made me forget all the sorrow of my father's house, which is really, I think, a beautiful point. He now talks about the event that he said he's forgotten. God has made me forget all the sorrow of my father's house. Divine forgetting, then, is not the erasure of memory. It's not the cleaning off of the hard drive. Divine forgetting is not the erasure of memory. Per Joseph, it's the capacity to remember the event without feeling the sting. He didn't say, I've forgotten what my brothers did to me. He said, I've been able to forget the sorrow. Not that the sorrow was not real, not that it didn't happen. But you know that the work of forgiveness is taking root in your heart when you begin to get distance on the event and perspective on the event and you begin to realize, I can remember that horrible moment without feeling the same stinging, waspish bitterness that I felt for so long in my heart. 
a distance, a divine work of forgiveness is happening in you. Maybe one or two more here. And there's a lot more than this. Don't be grieved or angry with yourself because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth. This is where I think it really gets remarkable. He looks at them and says, you sold me, but God sent me. And I don't think texts like this are for us to start arguing about, you know, free will and predestination and building doctrines out of them. I just, I don't think that's what texts like this are for. I, I don't think any of us are ever going to fully be able to explicate or figure out the way the divine works in us and all the rules of that interaction. But what's really beautiful about what Joseph says here to his brothers, I, I think what's really a profound indication that forgiveness has begun to take root in your heart is Joseph is able to look at this most horrid thing that's happened and he's able to see providence and grace and the work of the divine in it. He says, you may have sold me here, but God superintended your selling to send me here. Somehow, somehow this horrible event has been turned around. I, for one, I don't think God makes horrible things happen, but I think God does come into a world where horrible things happen and says, let's see what we can do with this now. Let's see how we can redeem it. God is so economic and utilitarian that there is the redemption of even the worst stuff. And Joseph now sees, and watch this, he not only sees that it's been redeemed for his good, he had a second son named Ephraim, and he said, call him Ephraim, for that name means God has made me prosper in the land of my adversity. But the work of forgiveness begins to give perspective that there is so much grace and love in this universe. God has so infused the universe with the capacity for redemption that we can look at the horrid event and say, in the midst of that, there has been prosperity. The wound has been turned and redeemed until good has come from it. And Joseph said, not only have I prospered in the land of my adversity, he said, God sent me here to preserve a posterity for you. In other words, God used this awful thing that you did. And as you worked it through in your own heart and obviously have come to your place of change, I saw it when you were willing to stand up for your little brother, Benjamin. I saw that you were changed men, that even now, this that was begun by your horrible act has been redeemed to the end that we are here together and you are going to be preserved along with your children. Ultimately, the story says that, he says, I want you to go back and I want you to tell dad, I want you to tell dad that I'm good, that I'm fine. Gives his brothers kind of a synopsis of what he wants them to tell their father. Not included in that was what they had done to him. That was between them and their father. And if they wanted to tell him, that would be their responsibility. Joseph said, I want you to go back and I want you to tell dad all the good. And I want you to bring him here to be with me. There's an indication that forgiveness has taken place in your heart. When you're ready to let go of the story and you're ready to truly put that story to rest. God has made me prosper. The Lord has made me forget. And may we remember, and I'll close with this, may we remember that when we're talking about forgiveness, we're not just talking about us forgiving others. 50% is us learning how to be forgiven. Because surely it would be a great coincidence if everybody listening to this, if all of us were just the ones who've been hurt. We are not only the ones who've been hurt, we are the ones who've done the hurting. We are the ones that have committed the wrong. We need to be forgiven as much as we forgive. I hope this story from the life of Joseph helps you. Uh, and I, hel I hope it helps you see, even in your own heart, where you are with 
this issue. And I hope it brings all of us closer together. Uh, that's what everybody church is. It's everybody. Those who have hurt and those who have done the hurting. May we all, by God's grace, forgive and be forgiven. It's been great being with you again. I love you guys. We'll see you soon, and we'll talk sooner. I'm trading deadlines for a softer ceiling. I'm trading lonely for a truer feeling. I'm trading easy for a harder healing. But one that leaves me whole. Trading running for a hand beside me Trading my shadows for a light that won't hide me I'm trading money for the love it won't buy me And a little less control pick up so much when we're living that we should never hold we carry so much that we shouldn't own but all that i need is what i've been given right inside this skin everything else that doesn't treat me well I'm trading in mm -hmm. I'm trading in mm -hmm. oh, That was a funky note. All right, continuing. I'm trading safety the world has sold me For something wilder and real and holy For what the ghost of my father told me That you're already home mm -hmm. Anywhere you go mm -hmm. And we pick up so much when we're living That we should never own we carry so much that we should hold mm -hmm. But all that I need I've already been given Right inside this skin And everything else That doesn't treat me well I'm trading in Trading in mm -hmm. I'm trading deadlines for a softer ceiling Trading my lonely for a truer feeling I'm trading easy for a harder healing but one that leaves me whole. Bobby Joe Valentine's voice is a soothing balm for the soul. That depth can only come from the experience that it takes to walk the hard stuff, the hard stuff of forgiveness. Everybody Church is a 501c3 nonprofit, and it's a place where we're taking and we're changing the conversation from division and rejection to one of radical love and eternal acceptance. Because you're here, I believe that this message resonates with you. And so I encourage you to go to everybodychurch.com and make a contribution. Give back to the mission. Spread the love. Okay, I've enjoyed being with you today. Go love somebody, and we'll see you next time.